We're going to be looking at dogs and a very timely show on a man who makes clocks, makes and sells clocks. And we're going to be doing some actual painting of clocks later Is on. Is that right? I yeah. didn't know that. Got your painting smock with you? Well, I don't, but I'll try not to get anything wet here. Okay, we'll see how you do. Okay. Now, our first story is about the Yankee Golden Retriever Rescue League in Weston. Lynn Kelleher reports. YGR was established in 1985. Uh, it's a nonprofit, charitable organization, primarily run by volunteers, uh, which has placed over 2,400 golden retrievers since we've been founded in new adoptive homes. It was started by two women, one of both of whom were active in the Yankee Golden Retriever Breeders Club. And they began to realize that golden retrievers were becoming very popular. They were uh, in the top AKC lists. They were in commercials all the time. And uh, they were starting to show up in pounds because people bought these cute puppies and then discovered, uh-oh, they get bigger and they need training and they shed and they were discarding them. And so Joan Puglia and Susan Foster um, started the organization in 1985. They are still our co-founders. And uh, I don't know how they've done it for 13 years, but uh, they've been answering the phone and, and uh, really putting their heart and souls into the organization for all these years. Charlie was a senior stray who was in a pound. He was in his 11th hour on his tenth day he was going to be put down and someone called either Joan or Susan and they got Charlie and rescued him at the last hour and he was adopted um, and that was the beginning of YGRR and it's still very much word of mouth today uh, we make a major point of trying to have the shelters know about us the MSPCA uh, veterinarians the people that are most likely to know if somebody is in need of turning in a dog to us our hotline operates 24 hours a day, and every day there's calls about somebody wanting to turn in a golden to us. You're going to find that a golden uh, is a very loving and a very affectionate dog, but they want that from you, too. They demand constant adoration, as one person said. The paw will come up saying, pet me, pet me, and you finally have to say, enough, and they have to learn what that word means. Uh, they, they are very people-oriented dog. They're not a dog that can just be left on their own. Uh, they do need exercise. Uh, and by exercise, I don't mean just a sedate walk around the block. I mean a chance to really run and chase tennis balls. I mean, golden retrievers love to chase tennis balls. They, they need that kind of exercise. Um, they shed, and people need to be prepared for that. If you wear black slacks, you're going to scoot out the door the minute you put your slacks on and not go by the dog, you're going to have golden retriever hairs on it. Uh, so people need to understand that. But they are an extremely affectionate, loving, very wonderful family dog. Uh, but they do need obedience training. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we get so many dogs turned into us is because people didn't take the time to train them. The first step in adopting a golden retriever is to call the YGRR hotline, which is printed on the cover of our newsletter. And you'll hear different messages, whether you want to adopt or whether you want to turn in a dog. You push the button that says you want to adopt. And a volunteer monitors that uh, particular phone line every day and sends out the adoption packets, which has a full packet of information saying, do you really want to adopt a golden? Do you understand that a golden sheds, that uh, they need exercise, that they're a very people-oriented dog? And after the person completes the application, they mail it to what we call a home visit coordinator who is somewhere near them. We have them all over New England. And then a home visit will be scheduled and a volunteer will come out and visit the home, um, answer any questions that the family may have, and try to make an assessment of the family. For example, it's very important for us to note, um, is there an elderly parent that lives with the family that maybe suggests that it should be a quieter dog placed in this home? Are there very young children in the home? We will not place a stray in a family with children under the age of 10. The home visit is, is completed successfully, and we do have a fencing requirement that there's some kind of secure fenced enclosure 
for the dog who does not understand that this is home when he comes, and it's going to take him several months to understand this is home, and he might try to go back home, um, then they have an appointment to come out and see the dogs and see where the chemistry is. I think there's a lot of uh, need for the word to be gotten out more than it has. Um, as a resource to the families who need to turn a dog in and may be feeling very traumatic about this, they would feel a lot better if they knew they were turning it into an organization that is going to screen potential adopters as well as we do, rather than taking their chances and turning it to a pound. And the one thing that we beg people never to do is say, free to a good home. Because more often than not, those are the animals picked up for animal experimentation. The most success we could have in the world would be to go out of business, because nobody needed us anymore. But that isn't going to happen. So we have to gear up for what we know is going to be the case, that we are going to be needed more and more. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. Now, have you considered um, adopting a dog, Susan? Mm, I haven't lately. Um. <laughs> lately, huh? But you did shortly before that? No. I, I feel both of us, um, Hess and I, both working full time, so I yeah. feel like it's, it's kind of, um, you know, tough leaving the dog all day long. What about mm -hmm. yourself? You know, we thought about it for a while, and then we actually went out and ad adopted a dog uh, just three or four weeks ago. Oh, did actually. you really? Yep. What'd you get? We got, um, he's kind of an unusual dog. He's a mix between a German Shepherd and Maybe a yellow lab and a few other things, I think. Oh, nice. But it's really nice. It's a big responsibility. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and that's it. And that's yeah. why an organization like this is important, because a lot of people might have a dog like a golden retriever and find that they, they can't handle it anymore. Yeah, you definitely have to know what you're getting into. For instance, uh, mm -hmm. the dog does shed, especially mm -hmm. the golden retrievers, as she mentioned two or three times. Mm -hmm. um, we're, especially this time of the year in the spring, we're constantly um, you know, brushing our dog and yeah. we still, it's a losing battle no matter mm -hmm. what we do. There's, there's hair everywhere. There is, yeah. Um, and you know, you have to, you know, if you're running a little late, you have to make sure you get home and mm -hmm. take him out for a walk. If he's crying in the middle of the morning, you have to get up and let him yeah, out. Too. Yeah, you have to make the time yep. to do all that stuff. And some people might not realize this when they do, you know, mm -hmm. get a dog. Yeah. In fact, I know a woman, she has three children, she works full time, and, and she realized it was a mistake to to have a dog. Yeah. So luckily she was able to find a nice family for her dog, but if, if she couldn't, and if mm -hmm. she doesn't have a golden retriever, but an organization like this is, is wonderful for people yeah. in that situation. Yeah. It's really important that you know what you're getting into. One nice thing about the place that we went to was they gave a little history of each dog and mm -hmm. you were able to find out what type of home it lived in. Um, is it used to being with little children mm -hmm. or older people? Mm -hmm. um, will it rip up your house? Does it constantly need attention? That's important. There's a lot of things that you really need to find out about. Yeah. It has to match the personalities. Absolutely. That's right. We found a good match. Good. So our next story has nothing to do with dogs, but it's a very timely piece. We're going to go up to Rockport and take a look at a man who makes and sells clocks. Rockport artist Tim Giroso has a lot of time in his hands. He spent his hours creating hundreds of uniquely designed clocks at his store on Bearskin Neck called Half Moon Harry. I always painted and drew and did landscapes and pictures and um, just different things and one day a, a drawing or painting that I did was perfect to put a hole in it and ever since everything I've painted and drawn I had to drill a hole dead center. Well the clocks evolve, they, they uh, bounce off of uh, maybe a, a simple idea um, and then it, it keeps going and on and on. So some of the clocks have taken actually months to do. I remember starting uh, the Alice in Wonderland teapot clock in September and finishing it in June because I go back to it and put time into it. Um, so some of the early ones are uh, um, old time favorites, but it seems that um, it's always the newest one I'm working on. The next one is the one that's my favorite, uh, whichever's fresh. I spent seven years in a little beach house in Plum Island um, painting in a dark room, not a dark room, but a well-lit room uh, without <clears throat> um, anyone over my shoulder. And now I've spent 12 years in this little store um, 
constantly painting with someone looking over my shoulder. It was a complete transition, but I think what evolved is that uh, um, I constantly got instant feedback. If I'm working on a little uh, uh, painting or one style of dog, someone would say, I love that dog, but do this dog. Uh, um, animals or something, I think uh, um, I get such an immediate response from people that uh, um, it's really been a boon to, um, to be in that unique position where I'm in a glass cage, glass bubble here, painting and drawing. Um, for a while, I was sort of, you get to be sort of uh, one of the sites. So the people would leave their kids here and say, okay, watch the man paint now, we'll be over here, and come back later when, the, uh, um, uh, when we're ready to go. Uh, the Dragonfly clock uh, um, evolved from um, just wanting to do Dragonfly, doing a lot of research, going to uh, one of the best resources I found is the Children's Library Picture Books. Then uh, from there, though this is a butterfly, this is uh, um, carrying it to uh, the painted stage, all the detail work, working in different paints and washes and lots of inks um, and fine lines. Then to a next stage of being the uh, scanning the whole thing into a computer and playing around with the, the colors and the um, numbers and, and the little more fine uh, embellishments that the computer is, does best. But the control and, the, and some of the variations of hand painting just isn't um, always there in a computer. And then that'll carry over into the final um, clock stage. And uh, um, it's, the, this is actually printed right off the, the computer station of my own. and then. Uh, carry through to being a clock, which is uh, dry mounted and laminated and clock parted um, to, to the board. Another idea we've been playing around with uh, um, is took the original artwork um, from the center of this, scanned it in, and then uh, are using the computer to do both the outside border and to uh, basically change all the lettering that you see. Um, each and every time. It's a birth announcement clock. It features uh, the full name, uh, the time of birth, the length, uh, the weight, um, and the date of the birth, um, uh, which is pretty unique and actually an awful lot of trouble. <laughs> but uh, it's really uh, um, fun to see the response. The latest project um, actually started with a doodle. Um, uh, I was making these little canvas board samples just to play around with putting mounting uh, canvas to the wood for the first time to see what would come of it and made a lot of little odd shapes and sat around with my, uh, my kids and uh, um, painted an eye. And then said, well, gee, this is sort of evolving into something. And it uh, um, became um, this idea of uh, doing a clock um, kit where people could paint their own clocks. I think after 12 years of painting clocks, uh, um, it's time to make my own competition. I'll make uh, uh, other people do the painting of the clocks, and then I can just retire and go to Florida. Um, what I've been doing with them is uh, um, have these mounted canvas boards doing the um, stencil outline, like silk screen stencil outline, and then from there, um, complete instructions to uh, making your own clock kit. Well, the name Half Moon Harry, uh, well, my wife Lori and I were sitting around, we were trying to make a decision about uh, first to have a store, what kind of store, and then uh, the ultimate big decision, what kind of name do you give a store that you're going to make as eclectic as you can. Um, for some reason, it seems I paint better during half moons, and I enjoy painting so much that I could see that cycle happening every half moon. At least I get to do it twice a month instead of just full moons or no moons. Uh, so we knew that was going to be in there, and uh, Harry just sort of evolved. And the biggest question I've asked is, uh, are you Harry for half moon Harry? And all I can say is that he's the guy that hangs off the moon from our logo. The, the real success of um, Half Moon Harry as a store is the blend we have of uh, um, Lori Jo, my wife, as uh, the buyer and um, the chief display person and the real heart of the store. She makes the cohesive whole work of uh, um, all the strangeness seems to gel. Nothing really fits out of place, yet nothing should go together. Somehow she seems to pull it all off and uh, um, make it so that people say, gee, I've, I've been in a, a pretty strange place, thanks very much, when they come into the store. Um, we started it together uh, 12 years later, we're still here. So um, it's been a, a fun ride and quite enjoyable. And we have Tim Giaroso here. Hi. Welcome. Right. Tim, oh, Dave. glad Dave. to have you with us. Oh, Great thanks. Shot. Glad to be here. Oh, thanks very much. Seems like thanks. a wonderful business. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it just um, it evolved into being a store. It's uh, uh, um, a strange mix of things. I think that video sort of uh, showed all that, that it's uh, um, if something both works in the store and, and appeals to people, then it stays on, it comes back. If, it, if that same thing sort of turns up in too many places, like a unique card line or something ends up in a mall, well then um, we pass on it and we move on to other things to keep the place fresh all the time. So it always has a look and a feel of a, a brand new each time you go there. Mm -hmm. 
tell us a little bit about how the shop got off, got off the ground. Um, did you originally just sort of put up a sign and start making clocks for people, or how did you um, get started? Well, yeah. For, for the young uh, entrepreneurs sure. out there. Yeah. Uh, the clocks actually came later. The store started yeah. first. My wife, Laura Joe, and I uh, went to Rockport, had a, had a nice lunch. We had a, a, um, our firstborn, McGee, was uh, less than a year old sat around having chowder, said, gee, this is an awful nice town. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think in a half hour of talking, said, let's make a shop. We can do it. And we also were trying to think of a way to uh, incorporate our lifestyle so we'd be together, so we could watch our child grow and things like that. And uh, um, a set of twins, and 12 years later, we're still there and still wow. enjoying it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And your wife is an artist, too, isn't she? Yes, yeah, more of a, um, a designer. She uh, um, really has the... Uh, uh, well, the, the gallery sense for the, for the mm -hmm. store, the design sense of placement and display. Um, but more importantly, um, she's the buyer. She mm -hmm. makes the, the choices, the final decisions, the, uh, um, the right moves for the shop to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And you create the, cl the clock designs. And it actually frees me up so I can create the uh -huh. clock designs. That's great. Let's, let's look at a couple here. Um, sure. Let's look at the fish first. This okay. is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Um, the clocks uh, before technology sort of evolved into uh, um, the, the pace that it's at now, they were all one-of-a-kind hand-painted clocks on wood. So this is an example of that. This is a um, cabinet maker's Baltic birch plywood, and there's all sorts of ink dyes and uh, um, pen work and paints in there. Then it's varnished over, and I cut the wood so that um, the wood grain is part of the piece itself. So every coat of varnish, you get up to about five or six coats of varnish, and the wood grain rises to the surface and wow. sort of enhances the piece. It works mm -hmm. especially well with fish because they have that sort of mm -hmm. a, yeah. um, washy look to them. So uh, all the early clocks were like that. All the early clocks had uh, um, um, wood grain in them. You can see little hints and touches of them. And of course, there were a lot more work and a lot more trouble, and then you do the one clock, and then you've got to move on to the next clock. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. right. And now you have the new type of technology right here. Yeah, with this was the sort of the second stage. Mm -hmm. The second stage being um, that I could do an original painting and spend forever on the original painting, say months at a time, mm -hmm. um, and then carry that over into, say, in this case, this was a, a, a either a full color lithograph or a laser print, then the technology was such that we could dry them out and laminate each print and make it as good and strong mm -hmm. as, as, a, um, as the varnished clock. Mm -hmm. And that way, all of a sudden, there was production. And mm -hmm. We were able to really uh, make a good image, but then use that image over and over again. Mm -hmm. Where do you come up with the inspiration for these? Um, for something like this, is this your idea? Or would somebody come to you and say, you know, I'd love something with a Wizard of Oz theme? Um, um, I think work? having a. Contemporary Craft Gallery is a, a big step towards that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, what people are looking for, they say, hey, do you have anything? Do you see anything uh, in such and such theme? Uh, uh, this is the most enduring theme you could think of. That mm -hmm. People just uh, um, are always looking for a Wizard of Oz, something or other. Or uh, oddly enough, I'd say the most response is that um, um, everybody's played the part in a school play. Okay. And that's they'll, right. they'll say, she was the witch in the school play. She's got to have this or something. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of neat <laughs> about it, too. And then uh, possibly the next. Uh, direction, which was shown in the, in the video, um, is to uh, um, use both the painting um, quality, the center of this being all hand painted, and uh, then say, screening it, setting it into the computer. And on the computer, in this case, adding uh, names and numbers, maybe enhancing the border a little bit and the mm -hmm. coloring. And then that's such that, uh, um, that you end up uh, um, using the best of a whole new technology. Mm -hmm. Right, and how long have you been using the computer now? Um, really just about two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, it really in informative. I, I, it's it's mm -hmm. same as computers moved really fast. I think it brings the person who uses it up forward right. really fast, mm -hmm. too. Right. You, mm -hmm. you do a, a constant catch up, mm -hmm. and then they invent something new, and you do a, mm -hmm. <laughs> you'd learn that again yourself. And do you enjoy using the computer, or do you kind of miss the old work? Um, I do really miss the old. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it would be something akin to um, a dark room. Um, you never know what you're going to get until you do it well. Mm -hmm. In this old fish um, style, you never knew quite what the grain was going to do until you get that second coat of varnish, and you watch mm -hmm. the grain sort of rise up. Mm -hmm. So that's the, uh, the exciting part mm -hmm. of, of uh, um, the, the solid uh, mechanical uh, mm -hmm. um, touching of something and feeling of something. Um, though the computer has come um, a long way, I think that that's true that uh, um, there's always going to be um, um, inner needs met by actually touching a brush to something. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Do you still have requests for yeah. something like this? A custom? Well, actually, uh, um, this was done in a series because uh, someone remembered the work and uh, wanted to give it as a wedding present 
to each person in his wedding party. Oh, so he wow, gave one to great. each father-in-law, yeah. he gave one to uh, the best man and the mm -hmm. groom, and they were all fishermen, so it was all oh, like big trout, nice. and it was all, uh, um, uh, it, was, it was like rainbow trouts, and all the trouts, mm -hmm. that they're, they're, they're fancy, they're off in the Midwest, mm -hmm. I think it was in Texas or something. Mm -hmm. um, so that was neat, so that, they still go back to the, uh, the basics mm -hmm. sometimes. And how long would it take for you to put together, say, one of these type of fishes now? Um, not as long as you think, because I've done them quite a bit. Right. But uh, uh, um, the first stage is putting it into the wood room and tooling it down and sanding mm -hmm. it and really getting the surface just right. So that whole preparation, just like, say, a, any other artist's canvas, the better the preparation, the easier it is to do from there. Mm -hmm. So because the shape is already done and cut out, then it's easy to follow the, the contours mm -hmm. and the designs and make it happen. And then there's the timing to the varnish, you know, putting six to eight hours between each coat mm -hmm. and stuff. So, uh, um, so the, it's, it's time consistently uh, uh, takes time to do it, but um, it's rewarding every step of the way. Great. And what about the production of a clock like this? Was it a buzz? Um, well, now that, that we're into full production on them, we can mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, produce quite a few of them. Uh, we've had quite a bit of luck with uh, different catalogs. We've been mm -hmm. in, uh, featured in innumerable catalogs. We've placed over 25 clocks in um, about 15 different catalogs in just in the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and so then they want this clock and that clock, and, mm -hmm. and then that leads to the next clock. So, mm -hmm. so that's been very effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to pause now for a minute okay. and uh, take a look at a PSA. But when we get back, Tim's going to show us how to actually make a clock, or paint one anyways. Mm -hmm. Mother, you must know how to hold and feed and care for your baby. But most important, how to be there for your baby. If you die while giving birth, you can't be there. So if you or someone you love is pregnant, see a health care worker and be prepared to seek immediate care if you have bleeding, severe headache, fever, or very long labor. Before you can care for your baby, you must first care for yourself. The Safe Motherhood Initiative. Because our mothers are our future. Thinking of calling in a professional pest control service? Well, if you do, make sure they know about IPM, Integrated Pest Management. When the professional shows up, let them know exactly what pests you're dealing with and how bad the problem really is. Ask them about a wide range of solutions that don't necessarily involve the use of pesticides. And finally, have them make suggestions on how to prevent future problems from ever occurring again. IPM, Integrated Pest Management, better pest control, and a safer, healthier environment. smoker's life when it becomes clear it's finally time to quit. If it hasn't happened for you yet, it will. I gotta quit! Well, Tim, uh, here we are with your actual create a clock face kit. And this should be interesting. Yeah, uh, it should be fun. Bring out the Van Gogh and all of us. Uh, tell us what we're going <laughs> to sure. do here. Um, I, uh, I've been painting clocks long enough. I'm retiring mm -hmm. and it's <laughs> time to make my own competition. Mm -hmm. um, so we started playing around with the idea of a, a creative clock face kit and I couldn't quite get an idea of uh, maybe what to do for a cover and how to uh, uh, carry it through for a new idea. And um, I kept on doodling around. I would make these little canvas circles and then I'd have leftover shapes and make shapes. And I ended up that uh, um, I painted an eye on one one day and uh, carried it on and said, well, gee, why not keep going with this and do an entire um, face like that and use that to promote the actual clocks. So, in, a, in essence, we did some sort of a stencil face and then just different clock, um, clock faces, different oh, images. Okay. So this is what you got to do today. Mm -hmm. This is your job. So let's just get a good look at this. So right okay. now we're looking at, um, really just looks like it's a pencil drawn mm -hmm. face. Right. It's a simple stencil of a, of a face that matches the face in the, uh, um, in the clock face kit. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular case, we're playing around with a um, create your own cat face clock, all doing, mm -hmm. working with the stencil, uh, mm -hmm. um, and so that the, the possibilities are just you know Whatever. unlimited yeah. um, from there. But trying to make it easy, um, pretty much a lot of the uh, um, I can do it sort of philosophy that you can you know that there's no reason not to try and paint. I mean, my main mm -hmm. philosophy for painting for anything uh, from Wizard of Oz on up is to make mistakes and then fix mm -hmm. them. Uh -huh. And if you just concentrate on having a good time with it and 
doing the actual painting, um, the mistakes will fix themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'd say first off is just some acrylic paints, which comes with the kit. Um, just make it a bit watery and do a nice simple wash uh -huh. of, uh, um, of an area, whether you decide to do the nose, do the cheek, whatever you're really comfortable with. Um, and you'll find it goes pretty fast. If you, if you get into it for a few minutes and say, gee, I'd love to do a fatter brush, you move to a fatter mm -hmm. brush or something. And, any and then uh, miss certain things like, um, like, you know, obviously stay away from the eye, but these little white spots are sort uh -huh. of highlights. So they'll still come through when you wash it. Just remember they're there so that you can uh, right. put so the lighter you, color in that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, the main thing I think I, it, you might get the most fun out of uh -huh. is put just the slightest hint of red in your pink, just uh -huh. to darken it up. And then in your case, maybe just drape it just underneath that line, just underneath there, mm -hmm. under the cheekbone. Um, and we'll do a little bit of modeling of basically making it so um, you can uh, um, get that three-dimensional effect to something, oh. just mm -hmm. very simply. And in your case, maybe just along the edge of the along nose. The edge, okay. Yeah, just along that side. Oh, this is fun. Yeah. Now, are these on the market yet? Um, uh, they're so new. You're the first people to paint oh, on them. Oh, this is wow. great. Yeah, yeah, and so we're having lots of fun with it. That's great. Um, we uh, obviously uh, uh, keep experimenting with yeah. it and keep coming uh -huh. up with different templates. We've uh, um, um, pretty much placed it in several stores and, and have all the catalog interest in them. Mm -hmm. um, um, if nothing else, I can't mention them yet until the time comes, but there's going to be uh, uh, quite a bit of interest. And then we're uh, um, going to have it on our uh, website as a possibility, too. Great. So it's like endless, like you said. It always you goes do... to the web, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I guess so. Thankfully. Hmm. Hmm. So then you'll see this now. The other part that's um, maybe getting more involved in the piece itself, uh -huh. uh, in your position right here, you're in a perfect position to do a little finger smudge, just a wow, little okay. run finger with a smudge. smudge. And just that little touch oh, of finger. See, see now, you're now you're getting yeah. that real blend. Now you're getting that real dimension mm -hmm. to it. And, the, and even well, the same one here. Yeah, of course. And that's why I wanted the clock base to be of good size so you can really experiment yeah. with it and play with it.